As you know, I modified my Skywatcher Mark 180 telescope, which I call a Galaxy Hunter, and I received some questions about it on various forums and posts and YouTube comments. Now in response I'd like to address a few of those questions in more details. Let's look into that. Hi, I'm Tom and welcome back to Rumour Has It. Let's get straight on with the first question, in no particular order. Why didn't I fit an SCT focuser option? Now I actually owned the Bader Diamond Steel Track focuser for a number of years, but the main reason I tried not to use it was it does increase the focal length of the scope, which kind of goes against the reasoning for using a reducer. Now the main benefit of using the SCT focuser is it's finer focusing. You get no mirror movement when changing direction. But I wasn't sure if I would see this issue with a direct fit electric focuser, but so far it hasn't been a problem. But more on this later. Now can these modifications be done on other Skywatcher Macs? And the answer is yes. These modifications can be done on a Mac 150. However, the smaller Macs have a different design and the ZWO EAF won't fit directly on the body. Owners of these smaller marks can still benefit from flocking and fitting up an SCT focuser, although they may need an adapter to change the screw thread on the back of the mark. Now if you have an older mark, like I have, the next question is what adapter do you use? Well the one I use was made specifically by a small engineering company that's no longer in business. However, I have been able to source a similar one made by TS Optics in Germany, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. Brings me to the next question. Why did you settle on the Celestron 6.3 reducer? Well, I was happy with the images I got from the Celestron, but I had heard that the Astrophysics 6.7 was made of better glass, and it had a larger image circle. So I wanted to try out to see if that would affect things like vignetting. However, I found that the benefits were very slight, and the downside was the astrophysics reducer actually caused more of a problem due to the greater back focus required. I found that this caused tilt with the extra weight hanging further out. Also remember that the throat diameter of the Mark 180 is only 31mm, so having a reducer with a larger image circle is actually a waste of glass. How did you seal the screw holes left by the Vixen mount? I used a self-adhesive metal plate. It's a type you use to mount phone accessories. Now these metal plates have a 3M sticky pad on the back and they're ideal once you form them to fit the diameter of the telescope. Now that can be done by using a rolling pin or similar but speak nicely to your wife first. She's the cake baker in this house. Now the next question is back focus. Most reducer charts for back focus are based on the F10 Schmidt Cassegrain, so the information can be confusing because this is a 2008mm lens as opposed to a 2000mm lens like the C8 F10. So the information can be confusing, especially looking at the astrophysics chart. Now I had to experiment to find the proper back focus to f-stop ratio. The Celestron F.6 reducer worked well when set at 105mm. Now I tried adjusting it to achieve a value of 1700 focal length, which is approximately an f-stop of f9.4. Thinking this was a straight calculation on the impact of the reducer, but in reality using the 105 back focus was the best thing. Now more on that later. Does the scope still suffer from mirror slop when using the electronic focuser? Now I've been told that the EAF always completes the autofocus in the same direction, which should negate mirror slop or backlash. So far I haven't had any major problem in achieving focus with the ASI air. It always completes the focus routine. So is there any specific settings to use with the EAF? Well in the ASI air, if you go into the AF tab and then enter the advanced settings, I set the minimum step size to 50 and the maximum step size to 100. I've also had to set the backlash to the maximum of 255. 
Now keep in mind that each telescope is different and you may find better settings for your own case. Now have you changed anything since you made the last video? Well I have changed a few things. I've mounted the guide scope slightly differently and that removed some problems I was having with flexature between the two telescopes. It's a much more solid fixing this way, direct to the Vixen bar on the top of the rings. Now the other changes were mainly trying to resolve the curvature in the corner of the images. Now there's no corrector designed specifically for the Mark 180, so adding the Selectron reducer or any other kind risks problems with coma and misshapen stars. I tried using a micro adjuster to improve the flat field. Now this involved using a ZWO micro focuser which is meant for guide cameras in line with the reducer. And what that allowed me to do was achieve I think it's about 8 millimeters adjustment in back focus. Now using that with a tool called CCD Inspector I tried to find a point that gave me a sweet spot and achieved the flattest field, but it didn't prove possible. So I just stuck with 105mm. As a result, I have to live with some curvature in my images and try to process them out as best I can using flat frames or background extraction. But more on this later. There's some exciting news on that front. Next question, can you still plate solve OK at that focal length? And the answer is yes. I found plate solving works every time with the ASIA in particular. It just gets it right. Now sometimes I have problems in Pixon sight, but that's nothing new. I often have plate solving issues when colour calibrating in Pixon sight. I think it's a catalogue problem rather than a hardware problem, but there's an update there. Pix and Sight have changed the way they do plate solving, and it's now part of WBPP. How often this often fails in my images from the Mac, and I found that deselecting that option in WPP and manually plate solving works far better, especially if you increase the star size in the image solver. Now I'll quickly show you where you find that in image solver. Now I prefer to do my image solve here rather than WBPP. Uh, I deselect that option in WBPP because it always comes up, it always seems to fail and comes up asking me to alter things. So what I prefer to do is to stack it all without the option to image solve it and then I manually image solve it. And just a point on that, in the image solver go to advanced parameters and you increase the detection scale to 7. That's what I found I had to do to get the image solver to work on my images. Next question, have you noticed any significant difference since you flopped the scope? Well yes, I'm very happy with the results and there is a noticeable improvement in contrast when imaging. And if you look down the barrel of the telescope you actually see the difference it makes. Next question, where did you source the rings that you use? Well, I got mine in an astro sale bin years ago. I believe Orion Engineering can supply rings specifically made for the telescope. These are very expensive and they're machined out of alloy, but they do have a slightly cheaper rolled steel version, which is more affordable, and I'll leave links below. But if you can find second-hand rings that are close enough size, and cork lining works without a problem. I've been very happy with the way it grabs and holds the telescope. Now cork is a very stable material and it's often used to hold mirrors in place inside the scope so there's no worries about using it on rings and as I found it's a good way of adjusting larger rings so that they can fit your telescope as you can just buy various thicknesses of cork sheeting and cut it to suit. And now the big question, do you still use the Mac and are you happy with the results? I've been happy with the results so far. Although I do struggle with star shapes, especially towards the corner of my scope, it seems slightly worse in the lower left of the image. I put this down to gravity affecting mirror slope, and depending where the target is in the sky. Now you can minimise this by imaging targets when they're directly overhead at the zenith. If that doesn't work, you've got to try and process it out. 
Now, given all the issues, would I still recommend these modifications to others? Well, the short answer is yes. If you already own the Mark and you want to get more out of it for planetary or indeed deep space, then doing these mods is a real no-brainer. However, it's always a compromise. You'll need to accept that you're not using a reducer specifically designed for the Mark, so there will always be flaws in the image. However, there's been recent developments with the release of two new tools which both significantly improve star shapes and background flatness. The first is a tool called Grad Expert, and this is a free tool, and it does a much better job of improving the flat field on my images. I'll show you a quick example of that here. Now this is not meant to be a full review, so I'll link to a video in my description which will show you that full review. The other and major improvement in image quality is by using Blur Exterminator. Now this is a paid tool from Russell Coleman at RC Astro. I'll show you a comparison of my Cocoon Nebula images. One was processed using some older tools and that was the best I could achieve at the time. However, the new image was processed using Blood Exterminator, and I think you can spot the difference. Now I'll link to a more complete review on another YouTuber site, where you can see a full review of Blood Exterminator. Now I hope I've been able to answer some of your questions about the Galaxy Hunter Telescope. If you've got any more questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Now why not try this video next, which YouTube thinks will interest you, but perhaps this one might suit you better. And thanks for watching, rumour has it. I hope to be back soon.